I was uh, thinking about ideas for, uh, for the clip for I'll Forget You and um, I suppose it's about a world between two people who have perhaps had a history of a you know, a flirtatious relationship, but it uh, hasn't quite ever happened or, or wasn't meant to happen. And the song is really a, about a, the resolve that, that it's time to let it go. A friend of mine uh, brought in a, uh, a picture of a shadow puppetry play that was going to be on. And I just thought the detail was, was stunning and, and also just how beautiful the characters look and their interaction. And I just thought that this uh, magical world would be uh, the perfect setting for this I suppose this dialogue and this, this relationship to take place. I'll forget you in time. We started off with these uh, projects called micro theatres, which were um, small shadow puppetry shows, and we moved on up to doing bigger shows that we put on for music festivals. And Lior found one of our flyers, and he obviously, you know, enjoyed the aesthetic and thought, well, this is something that he'd like to play around with and he gave me a call and came to one of our shows and um, suddenly we had the job of building a music video. But uh, it was, I mean, I guess the interesting thing was that we had no idea how to build a music video and so we sort of said, well, you know, we can do something interesting for you but we're going to have to work with someone who can help us, who can help put, you know, pull this thing together. That's plastic. It was great to be working with a director and to actually have some constraints on what we could do. With a project that's a bit larger, such as this, your ideas can just, you know, you can get carried away with what you can do and, and the, the places you can take the story. So to have Natasha work with us and to have a basic framework for a story before we began was just was gold and was, the, was the, I guess, the way in which we could produce something like this in, in just a week or two. It's essentially it's a protagonist journey, so it's quite classical in structure, and uh, we used the uh, the space and the sparseness of the set as well as the um, busyness of the set as a way of introducing a third character, being the environment, um, which I saw as as a vehicle for the way that the characters were brought together and ripped apart. I remember Natasha storyboarding, and I loved that whole idea of the environment changing every time the the woman comes in. It's that recognition of being thrown off balance by by this person repeatedly and, and ending with a resolve that um, you know perhaps that relationship had its time and it's it's never going to be anything but but a hindrance anymore so it's time to to forget it's hard to let this go the original idea was it was more an Adam and Eve story that it was sort of man and woman and to make it too much like it, Leo would you know, for the people who didn't know what he looked like, they was concerned that, you know, were we going for him or not? I came in and the main character looked like a scarecrow. He sort of had straw hair, which looked like dreadies and, and a really kind of sharp nose. And, and I, just thought, I said, I'm finding it really hard to sympathise with this guy. And I went, maybe it should be me, you know, because this is kind of like me telling this story with, you know, and singing it together with this girl. So maybe it should be, you know. And, and uh, so they got me behind the projector and they actually sort of got the, the dimensions right and they took a photo, you know, of a profile and Steve went away and modelled the character then on, on kind of my silhouette, if you like. Here we have Mr Lior. It's pretty simple. Cardboard, pot scrubbers, sellotape, bicycle spokes. These are actually um, spokes off an old bike. Bits of old dowel. Um, the way in which we build our puppets is that it's all spontaneous, it's spur of the moment, where we're drawing, sketching, storyboarding, yeah. brainstorming, cutting out, sort of serendipity, I suppose, that you're looking for when you're looking for a form and it just happens to be there on your desk or out in the pavement or, um, you know, blowing around in the bush. So. There were a lot of challenges. The, the clip was about two months in pre-production in terms of from the time we first met and started throwing around ideas to the generation of storyboards and... Um, the cutting of the characters and rehearsals and things. And that presented not too many complications so much as just normal workshop difficulties of negotiating your way around your vision and the practicalities of achieving it. Once we started thinking about how the camera would move around a shadow puppet screen, which is normally kind of a square or rectangle, it was quite interesting. We wondered, well, okay, would we be sort of zooming in on finite detail? Would we have tiny little characters or how would we do this? And very early on, uh, when I first met with Lior, something, an idea came to me that maybe we could create an enormous set, a, uh, a 16 metre long set, it turned out. I think we all agreed about that whole moving one take in real time. And it was great when I first came in and saw the set that Steve built and the lyrics were kind of written, you know, over 15 metres. And, 
And uh, I, I just thought it was great that, you know, they were, they were literally acting to the lyrics as, as the camera was, was rolling. We've got a camera moving on this side of the set, we've got a light moving on this side of the set, we've got us in the middle, and we can't see either of the other two. So what we're really doing is we're listening to the music, we're moving along, we're moving our puppets, we're getting the right interaction between the puppets and making sure we're in time with the music, working with Tash who's directing us from the other side of the screen. But there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of planning involved with actually who's going to pass who the puppet, how we're going to take puppets off the screen, how we're going to introduce new puppets into the screen, how we're going to deal with falling behind in time or speed up. It was exhausting because I was positioned on a dolly and I'm shouting to four puppeteers behind the screen who I can sort of see as they're doing their thing and I'm talking them through the whole thing and they're in character so Stephen is like talking as though he's Lior. He's like, oh look, this is a really lovely day and oh look, isn't she cute? And he's talking it out to get the most emotion and I'm telling him, godlike, really scarily, okay, you've got 10 seconds to hit the mark, make sure you hurry up through the woods here and that sort of stuff. So by 30 takes, my voice was strained and the sweat was kind of, you know, dripping off, but, um, but you just wanted to keep going, go again and again and see what you could get. It had that real live performance feel about it, the nerves and the excitement and a couple of memories stand out for me. One is after one of the rehearsals, uh, we got everyone behind the split and had a look at what we were seeing and the puppeteers hadn't seen it on the screen before. And um, it was an incredible reaction. <laughs> And the second one, I have to share this, this is great, because the, the, the take we ended up using, the sound playback actually uh, felt, broke down with about 30 seconds to go. And we had a fantastic take and it was working really well. And so everyone started singing. <laughs> the, the puppeteers and a few of us started singing the rest of the song to make sure we were still in time to complete the take. And that was the take we ended up going with. So there's a lot of magic in, um, in, this, in, this, in this clip. And, uh, and I think it shows. And rip my life apart. It's, it's exciting to have something filmed. I mean, it's exciting for us because we've, we've just never documented anything we've done before. We've done loads of shows, we've been in all kinds of festivals, our friends have filmed us, we've taken photographs, but to actually design something for film is really neat. It's interesting and to see it up on YouTube and, you know, check out what people are saying about it, it's really beautiful. I tend to think that in this medium you can have a little bit more faith uh, and take a few more risks that the audience will participate in the storytelling process. What's out there in terms of video clips is just so bang, bang, bang in your face, just keep the, keep the audience there. Taking this on, I was aware that, that it's, it's, it's a handmade project. It's not completely smooth, you know, the characters can sort of be, be jerky and it really relies on the audience recognising that this is a human work, it's, it's artists creating something a visual world to go with a song and uh, and I knew that you know it's not it's not ever gonna stand up next to Christine Aguilera Candyman it's just a different function you know what I mean <laughs> it's, um, but I, I think I had the belief that uh, you know, and the faith you know in people that they're gonna recognize that this is about this is I guess in a sense this is folk like I was saying this is about people getting together and and creating and building projects you and I.